Welcome to the Playing Hooky Podcast with your hosts, Rachel and Nathan, brought to you by UtilityMuffinLabs.com, consistently rated adequate. Welcome, everybody, to the Playing Hooky Podcast. I am Rachel. And I'm Nathan. And thank you for joining us yet again. Uh, We apologize for the slight delay in your programming. If you will look to your left, you will see uh, the mountains in the distance. I don't know what that means, but uh, yeah, we... uh, Life's just been busy lately, so mm-hmm. um, we haven't been uh, on schedule, per se. No, we're but about a week behind. A week behind where, where we wanted to be. Um, and I've heard that the one thing to make a successful podcast is consistency. Mm-hmm. So I think it's safe to say this is an unsuccessful podcast. <laughs> but we're doing the best that we can. Yeah. Um, yes. But what are we talking about today, Nathan? Today, we are talking about stand-up comedy. Also known as stand-up comedy. Stand-up comedy. So we went to a couple of different comedy shows in the last uh, couple of weeks or so, and um, we got to see some funny. Mm-hmm. We got to have laugh attacks. So many laughs. Um, so I think it'd be safe to say that you and I have different tastes and maybe stand-up comedy. Not like opposing tastes, no. but we're both like maybe drawn to different types of comedians, would you say? I mean, I, I think we have... Um, yeah, I think like our our probably our uh, or originating points of comedy is mm-hmm. probably different, but I feel like um, we can overlap in a lot of places. Yeah, and I think the com- the comedians that I may initially find funny, you you like appreciate some of their comedy as well, and and vice versa. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think what I'm coming to realize too, because um, you know I'm, I'm never really seen a lot of live comedy. Mm-hmm. You know, before um, we met, I think I'd only been to one comedy show. It was at a theater. Um, and so I talk in front of my hand, my hand in front of my mouth while I'm podcasting as if I've never done this before. Um, but uh, I'd only been to one comedy show. And so I've found in the years since then that um, even bad comics are more funny live. You think so? Yeah, I do. I think that f- it's much funnier when you're in a room full of people laughing than mm-hmm. you just sitting there by yourself. Yeah, it's that's the same thing's true with movies, right? Like if it's a really good movie, the whole experience is different when you see it in a theater versus mm-hmm. when you're watching it at home. Yeah. Um so what was so let's talk about the comedians that we brought to the table. Mm-hmm. So I brought to the table Jackie Cation and Maria Bamford mm-hmm. and you brought to the table I brought to the table table uh bobby lee and Mm -hmm. then whoever opened for him because i can't remember can't remember their names either but they were very which is terrible i actually spent a whole like i spent at least 45 seconds to a minute trying to find out who it was a whole minute (laughs) but i I couldn't i couldn't find out actually so i went to his website Mm -hmm. and it just says tba okay clearly that doesn't help me right and then i was like well i'll just look it up online and Mm -hmm. i looked it up in like 10 or 15 different variations of like Bobby Lee Chicago mm-hmm. opener, like Bobby Lee female comedian. Mm-hmm. Like, like the guy that opened the show, the guy that was like the host or whatever, um, he was just a local guy. And um, I don't really care what his name was. Okay. Like, <laughs> <laughs> really? Like he yeah. was just the guy that is local. It was like uh, the MC, the opener. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so like I didn't really care. Like he wasn't. It wasn't very funny. So um, since we already like jumped in on Bobby Lee, like why don't you tell the people at home who maybe don't know about Bobby Lee's comedy, like a little bit about Bobby Lee and how you got into him? Um, I don't really know uh, a whole lot about his comedy because honestly, um, I, like he's just been an amusing character that mm-hmm. has been kind of like around since Mad TV. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't really have any like comedy specials out or like anything like that. Um, but I listened to his podcast, Tiger Belly, and I've been listening to that for only just a couple of months. But mm-hmm. like, I've always been a fan of Bobby Lee, mm-hmm. and so as soon as I like f- a fan of him in the regards of like he's kind of like a silly guy and he's very idiosyncratic, and mm-hmm. so um, yeah, I, I mean, I've always just seen him around like in the comedy. So when you saw him like on podcasts or listening to his podcast, he was just. 
you found him amusing. He's yeah. silly. You liked kind of like the cut of his jib, but you'd never seen his stand up before we went to see the show. No, I don't think I'd ever seen his stand up. Like I'd heard about it mm-hmm. and like I'd seen things on the internet, but um, there isn't really a lot of his stand up out there. Right. Um, like I said, he's not, he doesn't have a special, but anyways, um, he he was uh, on Mad TV in the '90s, I think mm-hmm. in the early 2000s, and he was on there for like eight years. So like the guy is funny, you know. People might remember him from that, and he's been on a bunch of different TV shows. And recently, he was on a bunch of different TV shows. Um, he was on one that got canceled recently, but he's just kind of like a strange guy, you know, yeah. just a strange, like um, very eccentric personality. Mm-hmm. And um, I used to listen to a show called Opie and Anthony, mm-hmm. which was like a morning radio show. And he would be on there every once in a while. And I'd seen him on other podcasts. I think I'd seen him on um, Your Mom's House. I'd seen him on Joe Rogan's podcast. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I just kind of, like, enjoyed his presence, his humor, his brand of, like, Mm -hmm. personality. Um, And so I started listening to his podcast. And pretty late, like, it's been out for – he's been doing it for a long time, for, like, four or five years probably, Mm -hmm. quite a while. And I only just started listening to it maybe, like – six or eight months ago. Um, but I just find him very humorous, but I also find him very, like he's very open and honest and real about like his personality and like his life and his depressions and just stuff like that. So, um, when I heard he was coming to town, I was very excited cause I wanted to see him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had heard like, he's probably going to get naked mm-hmm. cause that's like his, it's always, that's like been his big closer, but I didn't really know what to expect as far as like his comedy was concerned. I right. didn't know what that was going to be like. So we took a, a trip up to the Chicagoland area, specifically sh- uh, the Schomburg to the Chicago mm-hmm. Improv up there. And, um, I get, so first of all, I got you the tickets for yeah. your birthday. It was a little bit of a surprise. Yeah. Like you knew it was coming, but I had to tell you ahead of time just so that like you didn't accidentally schedule anything that weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was like my birthday present to you was tickets to go see Bobby Lee. Yep. And that was like super fun. But before like we saw the show, uh, I just want to comment really quickly on the mall. Oh, my God. I forgot about the that. Schomburg yeah. Mall that the, the Chicago Improv <laughs> is attached to was like it was like taking a step back in time. Yeah. Like every you listeners may have experienced this. I'm not sure. But my experience going into any mall in the past four to five years has been a really depressing yeah. um, state of affairs where it's like there's a lot of um, Pardon me. Sorry. there's a lot of shops closed down or just like random kind of generic yeah. kitschy shops like even, that sells calendars. Right. Like even the best malls now. The are fancy outdoor like, malls in the rich neighborhoods. Yeah, even those are kind of like not a lot of people there, you know, maybe on a weekend, you know, you'll see a little bump. But mm-hmm. for the most part, just like most malls are pretty dead. Right. This mall was like straight out of the early to mid 90s <laughs> mall rats <laughs> mall yeah. full of people. Yeah. It was a Friday night full of people, all ages, races, this demographics. Is the Wood- Woodfield mall. Woodfield. Okay, so it's the Woodfield Mall in Schaumburg. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know what Schaumburg is doing or the, what the Woodfield Mall is doing right, but something because it was it was packed yeah, and it, it was, was like lively. I was like, I can see why people want to come here. There's like a the ton day, going on. Yeah, it was the day after. It was the day after um, Valentine's. Valentine's. Yeah. So it wasn't even like it was. There was no holiday. It was just February fifteenth. And it was packed. And there wasn't any, like, special events going on. It was a Saturday, I'm remembering. It, yeah, it was a it was Saturday. A yeah, it was yeah. a Saturday. But it was, like, it wasn't any particularly special no. Saturday. It was just, like, wall to wall. And, like, parking was impossible. Oh, parking was so hard. Yeah. yeah. Um, I had, like, I just, I had not seen a mall that populated since yeah. probably, like, 98, 99. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when we were, when when I lived in the Chicagoland area, um, I worked in the Oak Brook Mall. And on the weekends, that's an outdoor mall. On the weekends, even in the wintertime, it would be pretty busy. Mm-hmm. But this was, like, this was old school. It was, like, holy shit. There's, like, hundreds of people in this mall. Yeah, maybe thousands. Yeah, it was, it, huge. Was, it was a lot. And it was like a huge mall, too. Yeah. Like, it built with all diff- many different levels and tiers, yeah. intricate. Like, if, if we got a little lost, not going to say. Like, yeah. we were walking around like, trying to kill time. Are we on the time. first floor? Are we on the third yeah. floor? What is going on right now? So that was, like, kind of fun and also a little bit of an oddity. Yeah. Um, but the the show in the, the Chicago Improv, um, like, the inside of the theater was... Um, 
so if you've never been to like live comedy show before, I've I've been to several and probably I've been to like six different theaters. Yeah. And um, if you're not seeing like a big name comedian like a Joe Rogan and Eddie Izzard, you know, uh, Bill Burr, someone who's going to draw like people to fill like a um, – like a a theater, theater right. right? But you're just going to a club. More likely than not, your seating is going to be with another couple. So if you're going as two people, you'll most likely be sitting at a table with another couple of yeah. people. Um, oftentimes the chairs are uncomfortable. They're turned <laughs> in an awkward way to right. face the stage. Um it's just the nature of yeah. the comedy club, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sometimes you'll have a table. Like, most of the time, there will be tables. Sometimes you go to really small ones, and there's just chairs. Um, and then maybe, like, a little bar table nearby. But I have to say, it wasn't too bad on the inside. It was pretty comfortable. Yeah. Um, it wasn't too squished, uh, trying to pack in people to buy drinks or anything like that. Yeah. So it was a comfortable club. Yeah, actually, I... Um my my sort of uh, basis of comparison is, of course, the show that we went to before this one that we'll talk about in a minute. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the only other comedy club I had been to was when we went to see Ron Funches. In Bloomington. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I don't remember the name of that club, but that was like, when I think of like kind of a scabby comedy club, yeah. that's what I think of. But it's like you're... Um, it's not really set up well. It's not theater style. It's just... Kind of, it's like... It's like a, a nightclub bar, whatever. You know, it's like they want you to drink, yeah. but then they want you to leave before, you know, when the show's over. Sure. It was, but, it's the comedy attic yeah. in Bloomington. And from what I, I've heard, a lot of comedians on their various podcasts and stuff talk about, like, I, I've heard several comedians say that, like, they like the Bloomington comedy attic. Like, apparently mm -hmm. that is a fun room to perform in. Yeah, because it's real tight. It's like, very intimate. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, so that was, like, not super comfortable. But th this one was. It, yeah. You know, it's a bigger venue. I, I would say, like, it probably holds maybe 300 well, people. Well, I, when I said, like, kind of, like, scabby, mm -hmm. I, I kind of more meant, like, it gives you the traditional sensation of being, like, in that comedy club. Right, right? Like, with the brick wall right, and the spotlight. Exactly. Yeah. Like, like, the improv in Schaumburg, the Chicago improv, um, it definitely is a nice place, yeah. right? But it gives you the impression of like a corporate sort of place. A like little bit. It, like everything is, and, and again, very similar to the place that we'll talk about when we get to it in a minute. But like, it's like they perfected, like this is a comedy venue. Right. Um, you know, we've got a theater system. Our sound system's great. We know where we're putting people. All of our waitresses are kind of like mm -hmm. working uh, or waiters. Waiters or waitresses are working off of like a, you know, very specific pattern in the room. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, yeah. Was, uh, it was very nice. But yeah, it was like. So speaking of waiters and waitresses, before we get to actual like mm -hmm. talking about Bobby Lee, um, almost every comedy club I've ever been to has a two drink minimum. Yeah. This one was kind of unique in that it had a two item per person minimum. So one of your items could be a meal or it could be a drink, whatever you wanted to do. And I'm not going to say it's like movie theater prices, like it's, but it is overpriced. Yeah. It's not cheap. And usually the food is kind of shit. Yeah. Usually. Although I think this place had some items that were really, really good. We just were not lucky enough to order those because <laughs> we were thinking like, Oh, we'll go out to dinner after this. So maybe we'll get a little snack. Yeah. So we ordered the chips and salsa, which was like someone sneezed and then chips and salsa appeared. Like it was yeah. very small. Yeah. And like, <laughs> like you're going to pay four or five bucks for chips and salsa. And when you could go and buy that bag of chips and salsa and like feed the entire room for five right. bucks. But for three or $4 more, you could have ordered like the nachos, yeah. which were just a heaping mountain of nachos. Yeah. <laughs> and like afterwards I was like, Oh, we made a mistake. We should have just gotten the nachos. Well, you know, their fries were pretty good, though. Yeah, their fries yeah. were good. We yeah, because we, we we don't drink. Uh, as a general rule, I like. I mean, we're not like teetotalers, but... Just I don't know like, what that means. People that... We're not straight edge. We're not like, oh, okay. you know, we're not, you know, temperance people. Like, we're not... Okay. Like, we're not recovering alcoholics. No. Well, let's, 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 like, go ahead and go into why we don't drink when we're out. Mostly, well, somebody's got to drive. That's the thing. Someone's got to drive, and I am a well. You you don't drink and like in, if there's a chance that you might drive. So yeah. typically, if if we're out and we're using a car, you won't drink no. just in case, right? Yeah, I've always been that way. Yeah, and then I don't drink except for when I'm at home because very little alcohol, <laughs> and I pass out and go to sleep. Yeah, Rachel's a one and done. Woman. I am like 
super duper lightweight. Like I, I have like one Guinness and yeah. when we found out why it's maybe it's not just because I'm a lightweight and I drink so infrequently. It's because I cannot regulate how fast I drink things. Yeah. She slams beverages down her face. I do. Um, I can't sip anything. And yeah. uh, that has like pretty, um, pretty, uh, negative results. You know, on that, on that, <laughs> that note that you just mentioned there, um, totally related to that. Uh, if you're, if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll probably notice there's no video. And um, I apologize for that. But what had happened was I just didn't want to record video. So um, there isn't any. How is that related to me slamming <laughs> it's drinks? Not, it's okay. Not it's not at all. It's <laughs> you just wanted unrelated. to bring it up? <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to bring it up. I just wanted to bring it up. I wanted to apologize. You know, for some people, they really enjoy watching us and whatever. I don't know why. But anyways, I was very lazy and didn't want to pull out the camera and all the lights and all the video. And so we just said, let's podcast. Yeah, let's just talk. Also, it's kind of hard with our setup because we're always sitting next to each other. And it's hard to have a conversation that way. I really enjoy this better. Me too. Because I get to look at you when I talk to you Mm -hmm. instead of like looking at the camera and hoping that you can see my face. Right. Um, Or or what I do probably most of the time is look at you Mm -hmm. and then start talking before my face is in front of the microphone. Um, but these are all like very first world problems. Very first world problems. Maybe someday <laughs> if we ever get like rich and famous, yeah. we can have a better setup, yeah. but that's not likely well, to you know, happen. It, well, in a, you know, someday we'll move into a different space and maybe we can, you know, better utilize. I, it would be what I would like to do ideally mm. and get back to the conversation here in a second. But what I would like to do ideally is have a place where I could set the camera up and set the lights up permanently without having to like break them down every time because we record our podcast and essentially what is like, it's like a recording studio, but it's really not. It's kind of like a, it's more like a, room. a dining room. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> like a dining room, but like we, we game in here, we record podcasts in here. When we have friends over, we sit at the table in here. Like it's kind of like our all purpose living space. And I've already built like a four foot by four foot or five foot by five foot, like a PVC tube blanket uh, recording recording booth. booth. And that's already a very large chunk of the room. If then I'd stick cameras and lights and don't ever take them down, that's kind of a pain in the ass too. But anyways, back to Doritos without the cheese flavoring on them. Oh yeah. (laughs) (laughs) The, the, the chips and salsa. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, the food was good, Um, but the food wasn't why we were there. We were there for the comedy. So, Um, you know, we can't break down in a way to kind of explain to people what the whole show was, but just like, what were your thoughts and your impressions having to see this, this person that you had kind of been a fan of for a long time to finally see their comedy life? Well, so, um, the, the, the MC, you know, he did like, I've got a shitty job and I've got a shitty car jokes and they were fine. Whatever. He was humorous local jokes yeah yeah he he was humorous he was like ah chicago there's snow right am i right Mm, yeah and and then um the woman that opened for him i cannot find who she is keep talking and i'll do some googling you do some googling but um she was really really hilarious and uh i wish um she was she was like super raunchy too um which is my kind of style of joke and then um, I think she did like maybe 20 minutes, a half an hour. And then, uh, yeah, Bobby Lee got on and I have to say, I didn't really know what to anticipate, but like, I assumed he would be funny just cause he's a funny guy. And I couldn't tell you like any of the jokes that he did, not that I would want to anyways, but like, I thought he was much funnier than I thought he was going to be. Like I... I was really impressed by how funny, like, I just, I don't remember stopping my laughter. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. He was super hilarious. And it was sort of one of those circumstances where, like, there were times where, like, you know, like, my my sides physically hurt from laughing or I, like, couldn't catch my breath or, um, and, and. He, there were some jokes he made where I felt guilty for laughing, and that's mm-hmm. how you know it's probably a good comedy show. But I'd heard the same thing. Like I'd heard other comedians say on like Joe Rogan's podcast, and I think on the Your Mom's House podcast with um, uh, Tom Segura and Christina Pazinski, where 
they were had all commented like, oh, I was at the whatever the comedy store last night and Bobby was performing and he's just like, you know, really onto something and he's so funny and mm-hmm. like something. And so I, I knew it was going to be good because all yeah. these comedians I respected had said so. But it was fun yeah. to see him live. For well, sure. And also, I think he did four or five shows at like during that weekend. I think he yeah. did Friday, Saturday and Sunday. I think so. So and, and I don't know of any other place where he did that many shows. And you could tell, like the the audience were Bobby Lee fans, For like sure. they were Bobby Lee fanatics, like people with like you know tiger belly shirts and like custom made stuff with his face on it, and mm-hmm. like you know I I always like go into places like that, and and I'm like oh you know I thought I was a fan, like uh, clearly I haven't you know I haven't stumbled upon that yet. Right. But, uh, I yeah, can't I find was, her name. I can't couldn't find her name anywhere. Like I said, I I searched on the internet for like. Legitimately, like fifteen minutes. Yeah, and I couldn't. I couldn't find anywhere. So, if anybody knows what that comedian's name was, she was hilarious. If anybody was at that show, or maybe um, I, I assume she came from L.A. She had mentioned like that she lived in L.A. But I think she was from the Midwest. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, if anybody was like at one of those shows or at a show adjacent to that or whatever, and you know who the female comic was that opened for him. Let us know because I'd really like to follow her because she was fucking hilarious. Right? Yeah, we we were we were in such a frenzy uh, when we saw after we saw Bobby Lee and kind of starving because we were subsisting only on chips and salsa. And we went and got dinner, and I just didn't make a mental note of it. So yeah. apologies to that comedian, but yeah. you were we, hilarious. We drove from Indianapolis to Schaumburg and then walked around the mall for two hours. Because we were, we had arrived in Schomburg. Yeah, not even two hours, like an hour. It, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So like, like a decent period of time, then stood in line mm-hmm. and then saw the show. And then by the time that was over, we were just like, well, like in the, the, to get up there was a little bit trying too, because you had an appointment where you were supposed to be done at noon. Yeah. So that we could drive up there in plenty of time, yeah. go check into the hotel and then go see the show. And the appointment that lasted till noon <laughs> actually lasted till two. Yeah. I hadn't eaten yet. So I was just like, fucking get on the road and get some food. And then by the time I got some food, I was like, okay, this is good. This is good. And then like, I think that's, we had whatever we ate at two, which I think was Chick-fil-A. Sorry. Um, not sorry. They're, Can't be mad at you. Chick-fil-A is the shit. Yeah. Their waffle fries are pretty great. Look, you cannot like what Chick-fil-A is about, but how can you not like a chicken sandwich cooked well? That's true. It's true. I mean, you know, shut up and eat the chicken. You yeah. got to vote for him. It's true. Um, I am buying what they're selling. It's I love the waffle, <laughs> waffle. Here's okay. Sidetrack. Yeah. It's not just Chick Fil A waffle fries, but in my opinion, waffle fries are the superior cut of fry because it increases the surface area on which you can apply salt. Yeah, that's fair. I I can get behind that concept. I do think that a waffle fry is better than a regular fry. Mm-hmm. But I do got to say, I kind of like me a curly fry. Mm. And and I get, but like, I like that seasoned, like, here's the thing. I like seasoned fries. I like curly fries. But really what I like is, and I don't know if they're still as good, but I, I really just like a Denny's seasoned curly fry. Mm. That's what I like. Like Arby's can fuck off with their bullshit yeah, curly fries. I don't like Arby's. Yeah. I don't like Arby's. But what I really like, what I like more than anything, more than a waffle fry, more than a potato wedge, more than a country chunk nugget fry <laughs> is a fucking tater tot. Yeah. <laughs> you could say what you want about all those other potato products. They are not like a homogenized chunk of hash brown potato smashed together in a perfect little cube missile to throw into your face. They are like perfect mouth shape. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, and like, I don't know if you ever did this, but I would take some ketchup and some mustard and then like make a little Venn diagram where the two would meet. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, And you dip the, Oh yeah. yeah. We're getting hungry, huh? Yeah. The best, the best like with fries or any kind of like potato product Mm -hmm. is the ketchup mustard mix. That was like my jam, like your pepper ketchup concoction. Yeah. Which is, I think superior to all. Yeah. And that's fair. A little off the, res for me but um the ketchup mustard mix mm-hmm. and then like i got a little bit of ketchup and a little bit of mustard over here in case i'm like yeah. my ratios are yep. off yep that's that's the shit right like a, like a painter yes in, yeah. his, in his, his yep. palette yep. yep just happy little clouds happy little clouds <laughs> with your tater tot <laughs> so good so the other comedian we saw uh-huh. so this was uh before we went and saw bobby lee and this was very much a last minute snap decision and this is why it's good to follow your favorite comics on Instagram. 
because I was not like searching out or looking for a comedy show to go to of some comedians I liked, but I happened to follow Jackie Cation on Instagram and Maria Bamford. Why would you follow Jackie Cation on Instagram though? Because Jackie Cation is a hilarious comedian that had one of the podcast that has a podcast and has for a long, long time called the dork forest Uh that I have been following and listening to for many, many years. And she's very funny. I like her brand of comedy. I feel I can identify with her. Uh, comedy and her ex- life experience because some of it echoes my own, even though she is a bit older than me. Um, I believe she's in her 50s, but like just the way she says it, like, I don't know, she had this one joke once that really like resonated with me <laughs> that um, is a Jackie Cation joke. She's like, I never knew how to talk to men. Whenever I had a crush on a boy, I would just stand next to them for years, <laughs> which was like, which I just, it's so funny, but it just like definitely like my approach to dating and men for most of my early life. And then she has this other joke that she said, like, this is how she got me was that joke. And then the other one was just like, and despite my appearance, uh, or she, she would say something like, you know, like I, um, my husband and I'm married to a man, um, <laughs> that may surprise some of you based on my current appearance, but, um, I'm however many years old and I have been to college. It's not like I wouldn't know, <laughs> <laughs> implying that like everybody exper- experiments in college. Um, so she's just very funny. Um, and I follow her on Instagram and I was lucky enough, uh, like a year and a half, maybe two years ago now to be on her podcasts because I uh, sort of uh, figured out how to email her and (laughs) knew she was coming to Bloomington and was like, hey, uh, I think you're awesome. And I have a podcast that I do with my boyfriend at the time. And uh, like, uh, I think you're awesome. And I would love to be on your podcast. And she was like, yeah, okay. Yeah. And she was super nice. And like, I got to be on her podcast and we talked about karate and she's just awesome, an awesome person. And, like her, where we, we did um, the podcast at her hotel and her like bed was lined with comic books. So she's like, she, I don't know, like, that's just how I envision uh, that's the yeah. type of person I'm going to be when, as I continue well, to get older. And when we were uh, also, uh, if you want to hear that episode of her podcast, if for some reason you know who we are and you don't know who she is, I find that difficult to believe, but I'll link to that. But uh, when we were, I was, so we drove there and we drove there on a night when we were like. So, so let me back up. Uh-huh. So I just saw on her podcast, she's like, or on her Instagram, um, Shows tonight in Indianapolis. I'm opening up for Maria Bamford. And I was like, Nate, Maria Bamford's in Indianapolis tonight and Jackie Cation is opening up for her. Can we go? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was like, I was so excited. And I was like, I asked him in such a way, like a little kid who expects their parents to say no. And I was like, can we go? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think like, it was like, we? Yeah. yeah. No, I don't want to go to a comedy show. I yeah. hate living. <laughs> I, I, I think it was like. A weeknight, though, maybe. Yeah, I can't remember. But whatever. Well, you're, the, you're the like, um, you're the adult with a bedtime. I'm with, the adult yeah. who can just sort of like, you know, mm-hmm. I, I live like the French, you know. <laughs> like, like, oh, I'll stay up late. I'll have wine. I'll, you know, whatever. So um, I bought tickets to a show, and it's January, Indianapolis, and uh, like I think I bought tickets the day of. And that night we go on our adventure, which happened to be maybe one of the coldest nights of the year. <clears throat> yeah, but that wasn't even the big concern for me. The big concern for me, sitting in the passenger seat of our vehicle, trying to find parking, was that everything was going on in downtown Indianapolis that night. And by everything, I mean a basketball game. Right. The Pacers. This pound, this pound, this pound. This town is stupid for basketball. It's true. It's like a love affair I can't begin to understand. We love basketball in Indiana. But so downtown Indianapolis on a Saturday night while the Pacers are playing was just ludicrous. Mm-hmm. Like you can't find parking anywhere. And and the comedy club we went to, Helium, is just like a block over from the field house. Yeah. So. And, and I I have some I have some like mild um, anxieties about time and being on time to things and being late to things. And uh, I think something on the ticket must have said, like, if you're not here by this time, go fuck yourself, basically. Yeah, okay. um, and so I was like, oh, we got to find a parking spot. We got to find a parking spot. And you're like, well, how about I just drop you off mm-hmm. and I'll go find a parking spot. And I remember being like, no, I don't want to be alone. That's irrational. Um, but then I was like, oh, they're probably not going to even let me in. 
because I'm just used to like a much deeper degree of scrutiny, mm. I suppose. Perceived and, scrutiny? Like, like yeah. just, yeah, like, like I, you know, if I walk up and I go, my tickets are, I, so I worked in retail. I mm-hmm. worked for a cell phone company. Mm-hmm. And when an adult walked up and was like, I need something for my wife, mm-hmm. we had to be like, no, you mm-hmm. go, go get your wife or no, you get nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, apparently at the comedy store, uh, and I don't mean the actual comedy right. store. I just mean like the place that sells comedy. <laughs> they are not. <laughs> they're just like, yeah, right. True. I meanwhile uh, managed to find parking, but I did have to walk about, mm, I'm going to say a third of a mile through downtown yeah. to get to you, get back to mm-hmm. where the comedy club was. And it was not, I was not scared or intimidated by any means because all things considered, Indianapolis is a very safe city, um, just overall. But also, there were so many people out and about. I think the basketball game started at the same time our show did, so um, it was it was just it was a madhouse. So eventually, we got back to each other. Um, we had to wait in line forever to get seated. But then when we did get seated, this is where the kind of crappy comedy club seating came in. We got <laughs> we got put at like a teeny tiny bar table yeah. that was like a high top table. Yep. So you had those chairs that like where your feet dangle and don't touch the ground. And then um, it was just like very uncomfortable. And w- what's like a consistent complaint you have these days about sitting? Uh, that my butt hurts? Yeah. Basically, Nate can't sit without his butt always yeah, hurting. Yeah, I basically I I can't sit at all. Like mm-hmm. if I sit for like forty five seconds, my my tailbone starts to hurt. Mm-hmm. Uh, we blame I cheap some, office I chairs. I have some theories. It could be that I don't have an ass. It could be cheap office chairs, or it could be I have a tumor. Uh, probably not that though. Um, I think but, you uh, just we had a bad office chair, and yeah, you have no yeah, butt. Yeah, I just I have. I have, I'm like a German shepherd. I have weak hips. Yeah. It's, <laughs> oh, my God. That's so funny because they do have no ass. They yeah. just kind of slope yep, down right, into nothing, right. just like just, you. Just hip dysplasia. Can't run. Yeah. Uh, that's sad. Um, but anyways, <laughs> yeah. Um, but more uncomfortable, I felt, than sitting in the chair yeah. was sitting with the couple that we didn't know yeah. right next to us and being like, your people. Yeah. I was like, you know, th- they were chatting and they asked me something about I don't know what. And then I was like, oh, have you ever seen Maria Bamford before? And they're like, no. I'm like, have you ever seen Jackie Cation before? And like, no, we just came out to the comedy club tonight. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, because it doesn't occur to me that like most people don't follow comedy. They're just like, yeah, you're going to go see a yeah. comedian. And I th- would think that like Bobby Lee. Yeah. Who tends to get somewhat naked at the end of his show. Maria Bamford also has a very specific kind of brand of comedy yeah. that if you were not like all in for, could be a little yeah. uh, hard to process if you're not like yeah. ready for what you would see. Cause I don't think that she's inaccessible by any means, but it's like, it's not like your stereotypical comedian up there given like punchline type jokes, you know, like one after the other. Yeah. It's very like, Kind of surrealist. I, I feel like um, years and years ago, she would have been considered like alternative mm-hmm. comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think by any means she's that now. I think alternative comedy is like very different than it was. But I mean like um, like uh, Zach Galifianakis mm-hmm. and um, who are some other folks? Um, like Brian Pashane. Yeah. Brian, Brian Pashane. Yeah. Um, not Pashane. Um, Maybe Ginny Garofalo. I don't know. Um, what's his name? Patton Oswalt. Patton um, Oswalt. I think like all those yeah. folks probably toured way Dimitri back. Dimitri Martin yeah. is another one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, like it's, uh, it's, it's just, it's comedy that kind of like has a bit of like a kind of flies in the face of comedy right? and, and certain it's, it's funny, but like maybe a tiny bit subversive. Right. Yeah. And, and I wouldn't even say she's, she is that anymore. I think a lot of her comedy, like I think earlier in her career, when I first became familiar with her in like the early two thousands, I, she had a special on comedy central. Her, her comedy is very much like she does jokes about real life experiences. And part of her act is like doing 
voices yeah, that are very self-deprecating. Yeah, too. very self-deprecating. She does voices to kind of tell the story. She does a lot of impressions of her mother, but like her voice, her real voice is like very kind of high and squeaky. But then she'll she'll turn and do these voices of these very professional, crazy sounding mm-hmm. women, you know, like and it's 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 really like jarring and super funny. Um, it's a but little like stream of consciousness. A little bit, yeah. And like now as she's gotten older and she's kind of opened up about like um, her mental health, uh, a lot of her comedy focuses kind of around like her life and how she's dealt with anxiety and depression and suicide and <laughs> suicide attempts rather and like her marriage and just kind of like the challenges of sort of navigating that with being an actress and a comedian right. in Hollywood. And it's very, very funny and I think still very relatable if you're a woman, if you're a fan of comedy, or if you have a mental illness. <laughs> but if you don't like comedy and you're not a woman and or you don't understand how to laugh at yourself right. if you have a mental illness, then maybe it's you're not going to get it. I've been following her... Since I was like a kid, probably yeah. since like the early nineties. Yeah, me too. Like high school, and uh, like again, like her, like like a lot of other comedians. I've only ever seen her on television or like on the internet, and she was significantly more funny live than I thought. Like I, I assumed she'd be funny. Like mm-hmm. I wanted to go because, like, I know her comedy more than I know Jackie Cation. Mm-hmm. Like I've heard Jackie Cation, but like. You know, whatever. It's like, yeah. yeah. It's kind of more my thing. She was super funny, too. Yeah. You know, not to take anything away from her, but like Maria Bamford was uproariously funny. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I laughed my ass off from beginning to end. Me, too. And I was like, I've been wanting to see her live for a while, but I don't know. I was always kind of under the impression recently that she didn't have like a tour schedule because I think that may be like stressful for her and so she does she maybe like announces dates a little bit ahead of time so she wasn't someone i was following to like check out and see like when they might be coming through indie jackie i do kind of keep track of but this was sort of like a surprise to me um maybe it shouldn't have been but it was and because i've seen jackie twice before once in indianapolis during gen con when she was in town because her husband actually works in the gaming industry and the other time she came to bloomington um and she was working on some new material and it was like very funny. I laughed a lot. It was definitely like her brand of humor. I, I enjoyed all of it. I would say it was like you could tell she was working on some new stuff and she had it probably like 90 percent of where she wanted it to be. Mm-hmm. And she was still working out some kinks that didn't take away from it. But you could kind of see like there were some jokes that maybe she was experimenting with. Right. Um, still funny. But, you know, things you could just kind of tell when things aren't like solid, like that puzzle piece wasn't quite in place just yet. Right. But it, it's fun to see comedians who aren't on TV, like to see them live, because then you actually <clears throat> right. get to see the magic happen of how like where they are in the process of developing a joke. And like, and then also, you get to see the finished product. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, al- and also like seeing their responses to uh, the, the how the crowd reacts, mm-hmm. how people laugh, if they laugh at something more than, you know, the comedian thought or like they don't laugh at all, you mm-hmm. know, it doesn't, doesn't hit. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, and I think there's even one or two jokes that Maria Bamford might've also been like tweaking with a little mm-hmm. bit, but Oh, so funny. Like yeah. the whole night was great. Yeah. Um, but the reason I say that, that I, I know that now, like it's kind of one of those things like you don't know what to look for unless you know what to look for. Like, obviously I don't know what their sets are. I don't know what jokes are new or what jokes are old, but having experienced comedians before, like about four years ago, I went to go see Tig Notaro uh-huh. um, at a bigger venue in Bloomington. And then several months later, she came out with an HBO special. And I would say, like, the set and the jokes were about, you know, I I would say, like, 95% the same. But the way she had evolved to deliver those jokes by the time the special came out Uh was, like, a little bit different. And I'm like, oh, I remember that joke. But she she said it, like, slightly differently when I saw her live. And, like, she probably just, like, progressed to the point where – she like nailed the wording yeah. and the she, delivery. She learned what she could get rid of. She yeah. learned how to time it properly. Right. It's really weird because, you know, we're kind of like doing a podcast here about comedians, you know, comedians that we've seen recently and, you know, very standard for our format. But like podcasting, 
in a lot of ways is the comedian's format. Like mm-hmm. they like comedians obviously didn't invent podcasting, mm-hmm. but I feel like it's part of like the the comedian playbook now. Like mm-hmm. you get some some gigs, you do some stand up, then you like get a podcast to do while you're doing stand up mm-hmm. and then I also feel like as fans of stand up comedy and like I've always been a fan of stand up comedy, I just haven't been a fan of like live performances. I feel like it gives us a weird perspective because like we can watch those comedians and then listen to them talk about their art mm-hmm. and like we get kind of like a weird fly on the wall. So like when we go see the comedian, we're like, "Oh, I get what he's doing right here mm-hmm. and I know why he's doing it." And mm-hmm. like it's it you know, there's no other style of like art mm-hmm. where you would go and like you, 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 like you don't watch a band on a podcast talk about like, you know, oh, I was doing this riff and then like yeah. I screwed up. Maybe, your... maybe if you saw a documentary sure, right. of like them in the studio, but right. that's, you know, that's not super accessible, right. right? You know, you like, there aren't any like painters who were like, I'm going to paint this picture and then next week I'm going to go display this picture. And if that picture doesn't work right, I'm going to repaint it. Right. Like, Comedy is the only thing, really, the only type of performance mm-hmm. where you can be involved in almost every stage mm-hmm. of that evolving art and, like, know what's happening and still be in to, like, really let it mm-hmm. run over you, let it, let you, you know, laugh at it, let, right. you know, let you enjoy it. So mm-hmm. it's just a really strange time to be a fan, a of, fan comedy. of comedy. Yeah. yeah. But – I don't know. I love it. I do you want to do you want to talk about when we left? <laughs> oh no! No, okay, I don't know. Enough, I mean, <laughs> let's let's put it this way. Um, so the show started at the same time that the basketball game started, and because we saw two comedians do full sets with a small intermission in between, the basketball game ended at the same time the comedy <laughs> show ended, which means that. Nate and I had to walk very far to get back to the car in the opposite direction, opposing stream yeah. of, of of pedestrian traffic to people leaving the basketball game, which means that there were hundreds, if not thousands of people on the street. And some people were being very, very, very stupid. Um, like you do. Like you do. And how long is a basketball game? Like two, two and a half hours. I don't know. I don't know. No. I I I went to every single basketball game in high school, but only because I was in band, I've and I certainly wasn't paying game. attention. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah. So let's just say that there was someone acting a fool, uh, <laughs> in the crosswalk, who was a white woman in her thirties, and therefore I felt empowered to kind of call her out for being a jackass, <laughs> and um, then I did. And her boyfriend proceeded to shout expletives at me. And then I, we were like, Nate was kind of like walking away. But then I and my leather jacket and mohawk felt empowered to yell expletives back at him. (laughs) And then Nate was just like, no, no, no. And then we're like walking away and he's like, please don't ever do that again. And he's like, <laughs> he's like, I don't think you appreciate how quickly things can escalate. And I really didn't want to have to fight. And I was like, I would have been the one doing the fighting. And he's like, no, <laughs> I would have definitely also had to been doing fighting and neither one of us wants to get arrested. So I'm not going to say that what I did was right, but this, this middle-aged white lady was <laughs> acting a fool in the middle of the street harassing people in cars and maybe being one of those drunk white bitches yeah. that bangs on the hoods of people's cars. Cause she thinks it's funny we, we definitely, and also running into me. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. she, like, she did run into you, but we, we got really lucky in that regard because we were in the middle of a crosswalk because yeah. it felt like if that had happened on a sidewalk, mm-hmm. there would have been like some bows being thrown. If that's what the kids say nowadays. I don't know, but like it was just poor judgment on my part. I shouldn't have said anything to her. I should have just like gotten bumped Mm -hmm. into and walked away. But, uh, I think the thing that really kind of pushed me over the edge was that she was like this poor guy pulled forward and he was just barely in the crosswalk in his car. And she was just being like a total jerk and banging on the hood of his car and making faces at him and flipping him off and then she runs into me because she's not paying attention to where she's walking because she's too busy you yeah. know showing her ass she's worried about what he's doing yeah and and trying to hassle this guy who's in his car and then i she bumped into me and i 
was like, hey, I'm going to be a little salty with you. And then mm-hmm. her boyfriend called me names and then I, I yelled things at him. I don't have what he called it. What he, what he even said. Yeah, I think at that point you're like, you're like bat radar to get to the other side of the street was up so bad because you were like, I'm in a crowd and you might have already been wiggy. And I'm yeah. pretty sure like you were drowning out all sound anyway. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, uh, I might have mouthed off a little bit. So do you want to, do you want to talk a little bit about, um, before we wrap up, like we're going to go see Bill Burr. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to talk about like comedians that maybe got you into comedy in the first place? So like sure. maybe like foundationally, like, so we can kind of draw a line to what kind of comedy you enjoy. Okay. Um, well, I think I, I, I say like the first time I really started to get into comedy Mm -hmm. was when I was in elementary school, comedy central was like a new thing. Yeah. And I was very much a latchkey kid and left to my own devices and all the things were available for me to watch and was yeah. not monitored and could watch anything I wanted. So I did watch a lot of Comedy Central. For whatever reason, and I don't know why, Sinbad <laughs> had a special. <laughs> it was on all, all the, the time. time. <laughs> he had a special all the time on Comedy Central. I mean, that. With those like blue, we have, like. Zebas, yes, pants. yeah. It was a Sinbad ah. special from the early nineties. I, I, it's funny that you mentioned that because I've probably seen that special like a dozen times. Yeah, and now nobody talks about Sinbad. I think he's just retired no. and rolling in money. I don't know. Uh, I hope no. that's what he's doing. But anyway, that really got me into comedy. Was watching that Sinbad special because I was like just old enough to get the humor, um, and. I mean, he had some really funny jokes, just the jokes he would tell about his family and his mom. He had this one joke about how, like, his mom had a magic arm where she could reach out and just, like, you know, like, he'd, he was, like, mouthing off. And then he'd run out the the, the screen door and she'd be like, don't you run from me uh-huh. and, like, throw him down. And I was like, I could relate to that because my mom never got physical with me, but she definitely had, like, a powerful backhand if I mouthed off. And I could just relate to it. And it was it was really funny. So that's the first time I remember really being like... Oh, I love stand-up comedy. And then um, my grandparents had HBO, and I remember watching, um, I think it's Bigger and Blacker, the Chris Rock special. Uh-huh. That also, <laughs> I love that. And I don't I don't know if it just was coincidence, but most of the comedians I really liked when I was in middle school and high school were black comedians. Um, I, I don't know why that just happened to be what I saw a lot of, but um, I think I, like... Um, Martin, I watched a lot of Martin, mm-hmm. so a lot of In Living Color. Um, maybe the, we only had Fox. I don't know. But <laughs> most of the comedy I liked were from black comedians and, and um, African-Americans. Um, but then when I got into high school, I had like a friend group that was really, really into Monty Python. Uh-huh. And, you know, you start to get interested in the friend things your friends are into. So like sort of that surrealist, dry British humor that's kind yeah. of off the wall and quirky. I really started to like, but I think the first time I watched a comedian that I still watch that special and still laugh is um, Eddie Izzard had a special called Dress to Kill. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was like, I was done after that. I was like, this is, this is the best thing I've ever seen. And I mean, I was between him and Chris Rock, like that's really, and, and this early Sinbad, like that's really what I started to get um, really, really into. Uh and then it just kind of like evolved from there into more sketch comedy type stuff right. and things like that. And then stand up comedians. And I've always really been interested in in just the format of like sort of like spoken voice and, and people just like one person standing on stage commanding the whole room, right. telling a story. John Leguizamo had a special too that I feel like was on HBO for a while in the late nineties, early two thousands, yeah. where it wasn't it was so like much a one man show. It was a one man show. It wasn't comedy, but it was like humorous but it was kind of like about his life growing up in new york um that i also really liked so that kind of like one man show type thing or one woman show i enjoyed um ellie degeneres before she had her talk show and she got real big she had a special on hbo too that was really popular and and played a lot too so I've, i've just i've always liked it well my uh my origins i think like my beginnings for comedy um well before i get into like stand up comedians um you mentioned like sketch comedy. I can remember like some of my earliest memories as a kid 
were staying up late on Saturday night and watching Saturday Night Live. Mm-hmm. I loved Saturday Night Live yes. when I was a kid. I me loved too. It. Me too. Yep. Um, I but was then, all about it. Like once we got cable, we so we moved to a new town when I was like nine years old or something like that. And that town, you had to have cable. You couldn't get television. And so shortly after that, Comedy Central started. It must have been like the very early '90s mm-hmm. when we first got it. And that's when the the first time, actually, that wasn't the first time, but that's when I had almost constant access to Kids in the Hall. Okay, yeah. So I remember seeing Kids in the Hall a few years earlier on HBO, mm-hmm. and it was just kind of like this weird, obscure sketch comedy thing. And, you know, for anybody listening, if you don't know Kids in the Hall, like, quickly get help. Yeah. Um, but Kids in the Hall was like a huge, like, it... It just immediately kind of spoke to my sense of humor. Mm -hmm. My sense of humor has always been kind of like off kilter, weird, like subversive. Um, But as far as like stand up comedy is concerned, George Carlin was the first comedian where I was like, this is something I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember when I first heard or saw George Carlin, but it must have been something of his from the Mm seventies. Um, and you know, at that age, I probably was just attracted to an adult who swore. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, um, like my, I probably wasn't that evolved, but you know, he too was just kind of like subversive and like, you know, kind of talking about like, these are all the rules that we've agreed upon. And like, maybe they're not the right ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. So my comedy preference has always kind of been along those lines um, and then in like the late nineties or early two thousands, um, I discovered Bill Hicks and okay. I, I kind of followed Bill Hicks and, um, you know, once I had access to the internet, then, you know, I kind of, I, I discovered Joe Rogan. I discovered, um, you know, just a bunch of other comedians in a similar vein. And that's kind of where it went from there. So like mine tend to be like, you know, um, I really liked Eddie Murphy, mm-hmm. Eddie Murphy Raw, like when I first yeah. heard that, of course, is I, I I heard all this stuff like way earlier than I should. Mm-hmm. Like Did you ever here's one thing that I feel like I saw way earlier than I should. I remember watching now I don't know if I was watching it from the hallway where no grown ups could see me, but I remember seeing Sam Kennison on TV. Oh my god, I, I can't even believe I forgot about Sam Kennison. Sam Kennison well, like seeing Sam Kennison stand up was killer so funny even yeah. as a little andrew kid dice clay like well I, like, I would never get into andrew dice clay i but. I, I well you have to you have to think like you know eight years old seven yeah. years old like way too young and here's just like a guy saying curse word nursery rhymes mm, yeah. like, <laughs> of course someone with that level of maturity yeah. is going to be like this is great no i'm not saying talking shit about andrew dice clay i'm just saying like that never appealed to me, and I never really saw anything by him. But I even I remember being little and seeing Sam Kennison and thinking like I knew that what he was saying was funny, even mm-hmm. if I didn't understand. Oh all yeah, of Sam it. Kennison was crazy. Yeah, like, absolutely. Um, but a lot of the things I think at that time, mm-hmm. you know, your parents maybe try to shelter you from. Mm-hmm. But I think when you hear, like at least for me, when I would hear about like, oh, there's this thing you're not supposed to hear it. I immediately was like, what's two live crew? And how do I hear yeah. me so horny? Right. Yeah. Like I want to know what that is. I want to like, what, what's going on there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's a different world now, but, um, at the time, all of those things are kind of like what influenced me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was big into Frank Zappa, um, who is not a comedian, but like very odd, um, sort of eccentric musician who has like a lot of kind of crude humor in the music and just kind of all those things sort of overlapped. So um, did you also go through a Weird Al Yankovic phase when you were in middle school? So I didn't go through a Weird Al phase. Weird Al was just kind of like ever present. Like, mm. like I've never been like a Weird Al fan. Like I, I was much more into like more edgy stuff, but I never would turn down a listen to Weird Al. I feel like between ages 12 to 16 I would have considered myself a Weird Al fan like I was 
I was definitely would have gone a, to a Weird Al concert. I had a lot of friends who were like big Weird Al fans, and I don't want to give the impression that like I felt like I was too good or too edgy for mm-hmm. that kind of humor. Because like I said, if somebody was like, oh, "I got this Weird Al tape," I'm going to throw in. I'd have mm-hmm. been like, "Cool," but like at that point, you wouldn't I have was sought much, it out. Yeah. No, I was I was well beyond like you know being interested in Weird Al. Like mm-hmm. Weird Al was kind of like. You know, its own little thing, mm-hmm. you know, kind of kitty, you know, yeah. at that point. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's what I was into. And, um, you know, it's just evolved from there. And, um, you know, I've been a fan of stand up comedy ever since I was a kid. It's one of the things that I enjoy. You know, I, I love music, mm-hmm. I love gaming, and I love stand up comedy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, th- th- those are the things. But yeah, it's just. I've I've been to way more concerts and playing way more games than I have been to actual live stand up shows. So I'm glad now as an adult I'm getting to like actually go out and experience it. Mm-hmm. I uh, I'm excited to go see Bill Burr. Ron Funches is coming back through town too, but I think we made an executive decision yeah. to try and hold off and save just a little bit of dough for going to visit the family again. But yeah, yeah, I, I like Bill Burr is another one. Um, you know, he hasn't been maybe around. Uh, as long as like, you know, some of those older guys. But I mean, he's been doing stand-up comedy since like the 90s. Yeah, can I tell you the weird thing about Bill Burr? The first time that I became aware of Bill Burr was uh-huh. from Breaking Bad. Uh-huh. And then I saw him do stand-up somewhere. That's funny. Yeah, I saw him do stand-up I was somewhere. Like, oh shit, Bill Burr's on fucking uh, Breaking, Breaking Bad. Bad. So I saw him do stand-up somewhere after that. And I was like, oh, that's the guy from Breaking Bad. And then... I don't know what happened, but like I saw him on Breaking Bad and then I saw the stand up. But in my mind, it's like Bill Burr has always existed. You know, like <laughs> it's not like Bill Burr showed up on the right. scene and no. then sometime in the 2000s. I just, Bill Burr is so funny and I feel like he's so good. Uh-huh. It feels like he's been I ar- think, around forever. I think if memory serves correctly, Bill Burr came up through like Deaf Comedy Jam. That makes sense. So like in the like late 80s or early 90s. That makes sense because he makes fun of white people in a way that I feel like white people and black people can get behind. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I was like, every time I see like a Bill Burr joke, I'm like, you're right. White people are stupid. Like, <laughs> like it's just, it's just, yeah, he's got like a really interesting perspective. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, then, you know, there's old Louie. You know, he was a cool comedian. And, here's, here's what I'll say about Louie. He's really funny. Yeah. I liked his comedy. His show was really funny. Yeah. His comedy probably still is, but definitely was really funny. I just think there's like people who are like not going to be able to separate the artist from the art. Yeah. And that's too bad because, you know, for a stand up comedian, even though a lot of what's on stage is their persona, like you were saying about Chris D'Elia, uh-huh. the Chris D'Elia we see on stage probably isn't like the Chris D'Elia that interacts with no. his friends and family, right? right? Like that's not really who that guy is, right. which is unfortunate because if that's true with Louie, you kind of want him to be the yeah. guy you see on stage. Maybe the guy he is in real life. You know, you can never well, know, no, but it's he, hard. Here's the thing. I think he was the guy he is on stage. I think if you think about what he portrayed on stage, yeah. like, yes, he was a desperate masturbator yeah like that doesn't seem to me to be out of like character yeah for that. but it's all right if it's a character yeah you know what i mean and it, you know that's a whole like container full of worms that yeah we could we're not go, gonna like open. we could have just a whole podcast talking about that yeah this um, isn't gonna never be like gonna do that no this isn't gonna be like a louis apology no. podcast no. but you can't deny Maybe some people can. I can't deny that I found him and find him very funny. And his show was hilarious. Yeah. No, yeah. he was, I mean, so. he was one of my my favorite comedians. Um, but, you know, the same could be said of like a Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby was a legendary comedian mm-hmm. and he's a piece of shit. Yep. But <laughs> <laughs> they are not necessarily mutually yeah. exclusive. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't, I don't have any Bill Cosby albums. I'm no. not going to run out and buy any. No. Um You know, so, um, and then of course, Richard Pryor, Mm -hmm. I don't know if like Richard Pryor was someone you ever got into, but I think that was like, definitely, I didn't have any adults exposing me to the like kind of famous Mm -hmm. classic Mm -hmm. comics of the seventies and eighties. So it was something that I never like listened to, but from what I've heard of George Carlin, if Richard Pryor is similar, I think it ages very well. 
because it seemed like the things they were talking about were sort of tangentially topical, but more right. just like the human experience. Yeah. Um, so I would like to listen to some Richard Pryor, um, knowing that maybe it's not going to like, I'm not gonna be able to relate to it and it, it's right. going to be gut busting. Like it would be if I were, right. if it were the seventies, but no, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I can't say I'm a fan because I've not listened to his stuff, really. Yeah, it was one thing that I really kind of had in common with my parents is that, um, you know, I, I didn't really get along great with them growing up. Mm -hmm. But every once in a while, like, you know, my dad would put on a comedy album or, you know, like my parents are really big comedy fans. And I think it's just something, you know that we shared that we had a lot of good memories around and it didn't really, the age wasn't really a concern because, you know, they didn't have stupid kids. Like they maybe had kids that were a little bit more mature in ways than they should have been. Okay. You know, not necessarily, not necessarily like I'm more mature than anybody, but like, Maybe we were I growing think, up a little quicker. I think you and your brother compared to the average, certainly compared to, I think you and me compared to most kids today when we were kids were way more street streets, street smart and, <laughs> and worldly because yeah. we had very difficult circumstances we were growing up in. Right. I think compared to other kids at the time, probably that's also true for you and your brother where you were just like a little more savvy on the way the world actually worked. You yeah, know, your parents right. didn't protect you for much because... That's no, just not right. the way it's life not, was. Yeah, it's just yeah. not how it's just not yeah. how we were raised, and it's definitely not how they were raised. Right. You know, so it's you know how how we would raise kids today is definitely different than how we were raised. For sure. Um, yeah. You know, for good or for ill, I think your kids should have a little bit more protection. But you know, back then it was like, hey, you know, if you're old enough to get the joke, you're old enough to stay in the room and listen to it. Yeah. You know. And uh, maybe some of the jokes you didn't quite get. And then a couple years later, you were like, oh. oh but that's true of like every yeah. single movie ever made. Yeah. You watch it and then 10 years later you watch it and you're like, I had no idea what they were talking about yeah, there. Right, right. <laughs> you just make a lot of – it's like your brain is good at making assumptions and filling in the gaps and then yeah. just you know going along with it. So anyway, cool talk, bro. Yeah. What about um, like Tom Segura? That's another one that we're yeah. Both well, big Tom Segura is awesome, yeah. but I, I think uh, Tom Segura is like kind of um, in in my comedy experiences, mm-hmm. um, maybe only like ten years. Mm. You know, it's hard to say because like you know I've been following. You know, I think I got my first like Joe Rogan comedy album, which is like I don't even remember what it's called, but it's like this purple mm-hmm. covered album with his face on it. He has hair. Um, and I think that came out like in the late nineties, huh. I want to say. And so, you know, like, uh, I think since that time I've just been following them. I mean, before I kind of like got rid of my entire music collection, I mean, I had a significant, you know, dozens and dozens of comedy albums, Sure. you know, now like I don't have any CDs. It's all on, you know, iTunes or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, Tom Segura, I probably discovered when they started having comedy on Pandora. Oh, okay. Because, like, you'd just type in a comedian, and then it would play other comedians that were, like, a similar style. And I'm pretty sure that's how. um, I think the first Tom Segura album I ever heard was either Thrilled or White Chicks with Cornrows (laughs) or White Girls with Cornrows or whatever it's called. Um, But, uh, yeah, I mean, I've been listening to him for a long time. Um, but he's 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 another one like I didn't know he had a podcast. I mm-hmm. just knew he was a stand up comedian and mm-hmm. then discovered his podcast. Yeah, his podcast is great. Their podcast is great. Well, should we wrap it up? Yes. Uh what are we gonna talk about next time? Uh I don't know. Okay. What do you want to talk about next well, time? Well last time ideas? last time I gave suggestions, you were like, No, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean I'll I'll i I'd like to hear your suggestions. Um what were, we were walking home and it's you called were, I'm gonna be dead someday. The Joe Rogan yeah, came out in two thousand. Oh, okay. Um, well, I think on the way home, you were saying something I had to watch some show with the guy who has the mullet about a baseball player. Oh, uh, Eastbound and Down. Yeah, we're uh, we could talk about maybe we could talk about our rewatch of The Wire. Yeah, we could do that, maybe. Yeah. Let's not make any specific, uh, you know. But we should probably come up with a plan off Yeah, yeah, right, right. (laughs) We're going to come up with a plan. A plan. Uh, You know, 
Um, yeah, because I mean, this one was kind of like a little impromptu, not to like you know reveal too much Mm-mm. to draw back the curtain. Um, but been busy. Uh, Life's been yeah. hard this first yeah. couple months of the year. It's As, tax season. It's you know it's New it's, Year. Yeah, it's fucking trying to get back in a routine. It's Winter. Hard. Fucking everyone's sick all the time everywhere. Yeah. So it's hard. Yeah. But hopefully, uh, listening to this has been somewhat pleasant. To distract you from yeah. all that bullshit, as it has been for us. Too. Yeah, and if you have any comedians that you think we should check out um, that we didn't mention, or maybe you know you you somebody local that you like, or somebody that you know you think based on our comedy tastes, mm-hmm. we should check out. Definitely let us know. Leave us a comment wherever comments are sold. Yep. And if you have suggestions on what we should do next, what we should listen to, watch, go to, etc for an idea for the podcast, do that too. Let us know. Mm -hmm. Yep. Also that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I guess until next time, um, we'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Hey, folks. This is Rachel from UtilityMuffinLabs.com. If you enjoyed the Playing Hooky podcast, think about supporting us. For more podcasts, art, videos, and gaming, go to utilitymuffinlabs.com. Follow our podcast on Twitter, at Hooky Podcast. On Instagram and Facebook, at our Utility Muffin Labs name. And support us on YouTube, at Utility Muffin Labs. Check out our other gaming-related podcasts, 25 Years of Vampire the Masquerade, and the Nerd Words Podcast. Thank you all for your support. Utility Muffin Labs, consistently rated adequate. Adequate.